I'd like to introduce here uh, today, Bob Yoho. Bob is a former Hiles Anderson student. He was there uh, the same time that I was there. And we're going to do a little bit of reminiscing and some evaluating and, and uh, see where we are now. Uh, Bob, I, I started in 1979 uh, at, at Hiles Anderson. Uh, what, what year was did, did you start at Hiles Anderson? I graduated from high school when... Uh in 1977 but i took a year off so i actually started in fall of 1978 and then okay, i graduated so, and i graduated in spring of 1982 okay so you were one of those good students you actually finished <laughs> <laughs> there there's a secret about that that i that i be honest with you i didn't like it that much you were only allowed to take 21 uh class hours I kind of pulled a slick one on them and took another two hours uh, a course at the church and got 23 hours one year so I could be sure and get out of there. Actually, actually, you were only allowed 21 hours and I carried 23. And in fact, it was, it was the only time I made the dean's list while hmm. I was there. And it, it was just to be sure I could get out of there in four years. Now, you wanted to get out for any particular reason or you just didn't, yeah, didn't, didn't like, like it? it. I. I was homesick, uh, okay. and and that problem was compounded by the fact you took a, a kid that grew up in the country and, and was basically a hick and never never really been to big city, never been away from mom, dad, never been away from any anywhere called home, and then you take him to Chicago. Freshmen were required to be on the bus ministry when I was there, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you take a kid that never been to big city before. You take him up in a uh, inner city neighborhood of Chicago. You drop him off in the middle of a place and leave him all by himself. This is before the days of cell phones, mind you. Yeah. And he's out there among a bunch of people that don't even really communicate in his own language. And he's farther away from home he's ever been in his life. And and that did not help the situation at all. Mm. I hated Saturdays. Oh, no. I have to say I... I shared the same experience uh well i came just a year after you did and it was the same thing uh i think my bus number was 70-10 i don't i some reason that sticks with with me i don't know if that means anything <laughs> to you but uh um, i honestly i couldn't remember that's that's parts i forgot yeah i think it's a blessing though to to forget a lot of it if you can if you can <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there's there's a lot of it that that needs to be forgotten. It was a it's it's one of the best and worst experiences of my life, short of losing family members. Hmm. <laughs> well, that's that's a good way to put it. I I mean, I think what it does, it leaves an indelible mark on you. You know, you yes, go through the rest of your life and it just stays with you. And I tried for yeah, years yeah. and years to get rid of it. Yeah, I, I, uh, I was never so happy as, as, uh, as I could be when I left there. And uh, actually, my, my wife, who's back in the back here, she, uh, she came up. She was my girlfriend there, and I, well, she wasn't my girlfriend there. She was my girlfriend back home. Hmm. And uh, there was a lot of pressure up there to dump your girlfriends back home. Huge pressure to. Yes. And, uh, she came up to my graduation actually came with my mom and dad and uh we were we were happy to leave my hmm. dad said it was the longest graduation he ever saw in his life <laughs> it's it's funny that you mentioned that about about the girlfriend i uh my wife and i have been dating since we were 15 she was 15 i was was uh, 17 and i was under the same pressure and i caved into that pressure twice 
uh, first year and the second year. And then I, both times I decided I, I wanted to have her back and uh, she wouldn't have me back the last time. And I can't blame her. Uh, but uh, one lady, one lady uh, in the church told me that uh, you're going to let that sweet thing slip through your fingers. And I said, well, she won't have anything to do with me now. And I, I can't blame her. But uh, the lady said, did you try praying? And so I spent the Saturday or the Sunday afternoon in prayer. And uh, long story short, we eventually got back together and I decided never again. But I'm thinking that uh, there was a reason behind that. They wanted you to dump that girl. Now, maybe you've got some thoughts on that. Well, I've heard, I've heard that speculation by somebody else that went there that, that I think that maybe if, if that uh, your spouse has Hiles Anderson connections, you have Hiles Anderson connections, I suppose they might think that that'll produce Hiles Anderson children. I, <laughs> and, and at least it, it, at least it invokes a huge loyalty to the universe or mm. the, the college, I think itself and i think that may have been part of it but uh you know they were they were big on loyalty's a, a mild word for what they wanted uh i think it's rather tame word for what they wanted out of people and I, i'm not i've never been quite that person i mean i i questioned a lot of things while i was there hmm. and had they known some of the conversations i had with some of my close friends We'd been tossed way back then. I was I was really skeptical about a lot of things I heard and saw there. And 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 time has actually borne many of those uh, those ideas we had out too. I'm sorry. Oh no no go ahead go ahead. Yeah, uh, we we saw things clear back then that that we that me and some of my friends that would probably not been among the lead, certainly weren't among the leadership of Hiles Anderson College uh, that we saw things that that wound up coming back and biting them the years later and and I mean things such as the arrogance the uh, the blind willingness to follow people that 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 probably shouldn't be followed and and things such as that. Well, for instance, I never liked Jack Scott from early on. I, hmm. didn't, I didn't like the guy. I knew he should never have been allowed to be placed in leadership of a, a hot dog stand, let alone a, a big church. But that was my theory on him. And I said so way back then. Now, I had him for English my first year. And as an 18 year old too. kid. Oh, you did, too? Yes. He, he was teaching whenever you were there, too. Uh, I mean, uh, for your first year. Yes. OK. But he, he kind of struck me as a nice fellow. I mean, from just just uh, in, the, in the classroom, I didn't really have any uh, connections with him outside the classroom. And it wasn't until later when I saw the videos of him as pastor that I saw this guy's really going off the deep end you know, from from what I I mean, I only had in one class and that was the only experience I had, but um, the other guy was Joe Combs. I would imagine you you probably had him. I think yes. about everybody had him. Yes, that one. I got to tell you, that one breaks my heart because that, honestly, I believe that's the finest Bible teacher uh, that I ever seen. Uh, hmm. Yeah, and, and I don't think you can dismiss that from the fact he turned out to be something else. I don't but he's still an outstanding Bible teacher. He was gifted that way. Yeah. I, I think that it's, it's possible for a person to parrot good material and yet not have it within their heart. I think now, that's, that's exactly uh, right. You know, when I, when I, when I saw the news of what had gone on with that and he was always somewhat of a mysterious character to me, you know, I, did you ever see yeah. him in church? No. Uh, and it, yeah, and my friends either. and I talked about that. We discussed that quite often. Is the fact no, we never saw him there. Yeah, I, I often wondered about that. I mean, the other guys you'd see once in a while, but but him, uh, he was somewhat of a mystery. And now I think we know why. I think there's a lot going behind the scenes that that uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> he was harder to find than Jimmy Hoffa, you know, when he went to <laughs> church. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's true and, that's... and our friends actually talked about that you ever see brother combs anywhere i mean <laughs> and 
And we also talked about the fact he was the only one allowed to block his hair. And <laughs> oh, you mean with you that line in the back? Yeah, his hair was that. blocked in back, and they never allowed us. Ours had to be tapered. Yeah, yep, I remember that. And I went through and, the. Uh, oh, go ahead. That stuff never escaped us. I mean, <laughs> we, I, I ran with some outlaws. I mean, and <laughs> and uh, and we just. We discussed a lot of things that wound up being the years bore out and proved over time mm. uh, about some of the things we were skeptical about or, or didn't take at face value. Mm. How about Harold Sullivan? Do you have any connection with him when you were there? Any? I I I know who it is and the rescue mission been, fella. Uh, okay, I saw him, but I don't really know much about him. I, I, okay, now that you mentioned him, I. I yeah, I remember him, and I remember what he was. I couldn't think of what he was until you brought it up. But yeah. No, I never had any connection to him. Okay. He he is actually on uh, Unshackled. He has a radio segment that's dedicated to him. The the program put out by Moody on different Christian individuals and yes. their testimonies and things. And I heard that. I was driving, uh, I don't know if I was going down to South Carolina or someplace, and I remember tuning, tuning that in. I think I was coming back from South Carolina. And I had a friend there. I can't remember the guy's last name, but his first name was Maury. And he was connected to the rescue mission. He, I think he was a guy that ended up at a rescue mission and became a, a student. Yeah. And uh, he was talking to me. I gave him a ride home one night and he said, there's stuff going on in a rescue mission. You know, it's a uh, pornography, whatever, you know, something to that nature is really nasty. And um, I said, well, well, you need to go talk to brother Hiles about it. He said, I did. But Dr. Howes won't do anything. Now, and then, lo and behold, a few years later, I open up the, um, someone gave me a copy of the Biblical Evangelist with that story. Yeah. And there's There it is right there about Harold Sullivan and the stuff that was going on in, in the rescue mission. So, I mean, we can get down a litany of these guys. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, what's the other one? Um, you mentioned Scott. Oh, D Dave Hiles. I had him for two years, I think, church education. Uh, that that, yeah, that was another him. one. You know, there were rumors flying around about Dave a little bit while I was there. But, you know, people that don't remember the years before the Internet, uh, you know, rumors are just rumors. There wasn't any way to look stuff up. There wasn't any way to confirm whether well, you just heard rumors. And as and far, as, far as you knew, you know, you didn't know any of that was true. But, uh, yeah, but I had heard a few rumors about Dave Hiles and and I think maybe at that time he was probably down in uh, the Texas church I believe hmm. but I was hearing rumors like that but I didn't know what was true I I, I kind of as as a youth I kind of admired Dave Hiles but then I heard those rumors and I actually didn't totally discount them I just kind of filed them away but there wasn't any way to verify it and you didn't know you didn't you had you had the internet you can't hide that stuff very much anymore but, right uh, yeah. back in those days you didn't have any means to confirm it nobody's there's going to answer your questions and probably throw you out of school if you ask about it. right yeah uh, I, I have some questions was, here i kind of put together uh what was your yeah, major at the college pastoral theology okay so we had the same major then we probably took pretty much the same courses and um, I figure pretty close. Yeah. And do you have any contact with any of your former friends in, in, at Hiles Anderson? I think you mentioned that, that you only have one or two contacts uh, from uh, those days. There's my, the pastor of my church went there, and I think he may have graduated a year after me. Okay. Uh, it, it, uh, and I know Oliver Reza, who went there. Okay, no, I, I, I recognize him. I, I know, know, know him personally, but I recognize him. Oliver Reza is is uh, probably the best friend of anybody I've got there and uh, that, that went there. And Oliver is probably one of the finest men I know that calls himself a preacher. Hmm. Now, that's my opinion. Uh, he acts he uh he just a fine gentleman all along i've actually known him since we were teenagers and uh 
he, him, him and his wife and, and me and my wife actually share the same wedding day, oh. same year and everything. We got the same <laughs> anniversary, <laughs> you know, which, which is just kind of odd, but uh, he's a fine fella. And then I know one guy that I kind of ran around with that he still lives up there. His name's Joe Simon. And we communicate a little bit on Facebook. <laughs> And I was going to go, I was going to see him when I was up there, going to go for that 50th anniversary thing. But due to certain conditions, I've decided against that. I've canceled my reservations. I don't think I'm going. Hmm. It, it actually, it actually has something to do with the recent legal uh, briefs file, filed uh, against Dave Hiles in the school. And, and hmm. uh, I, I Along with high gas prices and everything, I think now it's not the time to go up there. Okay. Yeah, I considered that, but uh, not actually being a graduate there, I, I felt that maybe I should just keep my distance. If somebody recognizes me there, I, I might be in trouble as well. So, so some uh, of my videos, I, 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 get, I doubt it. What's that? I think they want everybody they can up there. I doubt they'd run anybody off that was okay. willing to come. Yeah. And especially if they found out she's a pastor and they thought there might be some chance to send kids up there, they probably uh, wouldn't run me off. Yeah, well, there's a very slim chance that I would send anybody there. Uh, <laughs> now, I have heard, uh, I, I imagine you had you had Dr. Godfrey for uh, personal yes. evangelism. And yes. the uh, Fisherman's Club, you ever have any involvement with them? I know what it was, but I was never, I never worked with them. Okay. I kind of floated around from ministry to ministry. I never did find what I was looking for, but bus ministry, then the fisherman's club and then the deaf ministry and, and the uh, Vietnamese ministry. You know, I think yeah. I bounced around all over the place, but uh, I remember with uh, Do Dr. Godfrey, of course he was vilified after the, the scandal oh, yeah. and everything. But I, I was trying to get him on to, to interview him. He's in his 80s now, but he did make the He's statement. He's still alive. Uh, yes. Well, as of about six months, a year ago. Good. Um, I can't say for sure now. Uh, I mean, he would be in his 80s. But he did not want to come on because I think uh, they had the church actually settled with him because of what had happened. They, they pretty much destroyed his life. You know, his I'm ministry not, was not, gone. Not, uh, but they settled with him financially, and he said he he considered the church uh, at that point that they had done uh, done well for him. That that over considering what had happened, and the pastor, uh, the current pastor that's there, I can't think of his name right now. Wilkerson. Okay, yes, Wilkerson. Uh, that um, he thought that he was a good man, and that they had done what they could to rectify what had happened to him. So, well, I mean, that's cool. why I, I don't really come down as harshly, I guess, on what's going on there now. I really don't know what's going on there now. I just know what went on when I was there and some of the, the results of that in people's lives, you know, that uh, and, and the, the psychological damage. Some I think that, that occurred along the way for uh, maybe not so much for myself. I think I was more I kind of got into it. I, I was uh, I was a full blown Hiles uh, supporter up until the, the scandal occurred. And then I, I, I saw them when he began to vilify George Godfrey, who I, I knew personally out there, and I knew he was a good man, and Voile Glover, who I had heard praised up and down when I was there. You probably heard the same thing. Voile went to school and he was in his 40s and all this and that, you know, and he was a good, good, good model for character. And then all these guys are all of a sudden getting vilified as being criminals practically. That's what kind of turned me at that point and I turned from the movement and was away from it for years and years. You know, I was sending kids to youth conference and everything up until that point. Did you, uh, were you at the notorious youth conference? Did you have kids there at the uh, Paula Shaft youth no. conference? No, we, we stopped the, the youth conferences. It would have been about 90, one it was either 90 or 91 would have been the last one it could have been even 89 uh what what had happened we went out there we were out there twice i think when i was a youth pastor and the one time we went out there we were, we were kept in a home of a family a guy and his wife and a couple of young kids 
And the guys that were with me, see, we were in a Methodist church. It was a fundamentalist Methodist church. Yeah. And, uh, Dr. Hiles had actually preached there. And I tell the guys that they said, well, you're, you're a liberal. No, this is a church that's fundamental. And at that time yeah. when I was there, but when we were there, the man of the house came out and told, told the guys, the young people with me, the, the, the young men said, you can't wear shorts and, and, and sleep here. It was like 90 degrees. You know, you can't wear shorts in the house. My wife's offended. I said, well, what are we going to do? I mean, the guys didn't bring, you know, pajamas. They, they brought shorts to sleep in. And he basically kicked us out of the house and we had to sleep out on top of the car, you know, or in the car. And I thought, there's no more of this. You know, that, that was oh, the end of that. But, I can imagine. Yeah, I had to explain That's to the bad. parents. I had to explain to the guys. I tried to, sorry. You know, I can't control this guy. And and we found a hotel for the girls and we stayed in the car for a day or two. I, it was, it was a kind of odd situation. And it re- began to reveal to me some things about, about what's going on there. Yeah. I, I, I'm a, I, had I been there, had I been a pastor or a youth director there at that conference, if we were there for that convention, or that youth conference, and I'm still I'm still alarmed that not one person did this. I would have told my kids get up, go out of here right now. I would have done it, and mm-hmm. and and I wouldn't have mattered whether anybody liked it or not. I'm not, I'm pretty much. My wife could tell you, and some of the people I work with, if I feel strongly about something, I don't care how many of you. How many of their people are that disagree with me? I would have marched my kids out of that place, and when I got them out, I told them, "We don't, we don't behave like that. We don't talk that way. We're not going to be a part of this." And I would have walked them out of there. I didn't care how many people they had there, uh, give me dirty looks or, or threaten me or whatever. I wouldn't put up with that. I do and remember hearing disturbed. him preach. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm still disturbed at watching that on YouTube, along with the fact it's got over 600,000 views, over half yeah. a million views on it, and, and the ridicule that is brought out there. I'm disturbed that good men like, which I thought were good men, like Ray Young sat back there and not one person back there did anything. Mm-hmm. That disturbs me. Well, I think he that's was, just part of the mindset. Uh, I think when that particular sermon was preached, he was actually pastor of the church, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Okay, so, yeah, see, I hadn't been back there since Dr. Hiles had passed away before years before that. But I heard him preach the same sermon without all of the illustrations. You know, he yes. wasn't, you know, he had preached a sermon and he was doing this with the shaft, polishing the shaft. He wasn't doing the, the masturbation thing, which, which is almost unfathomable, but these guys have been I trained. Think... You follow leadership. He's the pastor. You know, you know think... I'm sure they sat there cringing. Yeah. I think back in those days, that was one of his big stem winder speeches he gave around the country. And like you say, even even some secular reporting is reported when he used to preach that. He used to do it, put that out above the pulpit and do it in such a way where it wouldn't look revolting, you know. And, and, yeah. and I think somewhere where Scott's mind went in the gutter, I think he actually was... I. I I think he was actually titillated by the fact he could get by with this kind of foolishness in front of people. I think, mm-hmm. I, I think he got some sick fascination out of it. Hmm. And, yeah, and, the things he, and the things he's written in his books, you know, that uh, really make you think that this guy was, was messed up long before uh, it came out. And, and I'll go and go back to it. I thought he was an arrogant twit clear back when mm. I, I knew him as a teacher. And we had a guy get up and uh, preach. It was in, I think he was in the bus ministry at that time. I can't remember. His name was Denny Keniston. He got up and preached a message and said he hadn't displeased God in three days. I, and, might have rem- I think I remember that. Yeah. And one of my, and I pretty certain, I know Toby Weaver, who I kind of liked. And I think Jack Scott talked in class the next early the next day about how how uh, 
great it was that somebody could live that spiritual life. And and then by that about that afternoon, they got thrown out of Keniston and some of his followers got thrown out of school. But I think Jack Scott and I know Toby Weaver sat there and was kind of bragging about how anybody could live that spiritual life. And I talked to one of my roommates that evening and and I said, I said, that is heresy. Mm -hmm. And he defended him. And I said, well, let me ask you a second. What ha if Hiles brought a guy to Fidel Castro to school and put him up to speak in chapel? What would you think of that? He'd say, well, I figured Brother Hiles had something from uh, Fidel that he wanted us to get. I said, you are an idiot. <laughs> and, and, and he said, brother, you got a bad spirit. I want to turn you in. I said, okay, you, you tell them what we were arguing about. And you tell them that I said, nobody can go even three seconds without sinning in mm. this body. And I said, yeah. when you go tell them, be sure you spell my name right. It's Y-O-H-O. Uh, and I never heard anything. But I knew yeah, back I, then that was bad. I, I wish I would have had uh, an opportunity to meet you and get to know you there because you might have saved me some some heartache years later as I, I had swallowed everything you know i mean i, I was I, not I happy like, yeah you know i, I mean I, I i couldn't i couldn't live up to the standards um like i knew that when we went soul winning we did the door-to-door -door thing uh i couldn't convince people to pray the prayer if i knew that they they didn't know what i was talking about you know yeah. and i wouldn't force people like, you know, do you remember when we had to go through the Romans road in order to, to count a soul that we went soul winning? You had to put it on yeah. your activities report. Yep. Yeah, for a while, all you had to do was so many hours, and then they changed it. Now you have to go through the Romans road. Well, if I'm going with a partner, I'm only talking to maybe four or five people a day, you know, in depth. And if the person did not have the interest, I would not push them. I wouldn't take them through the Romans road. I got the merits and I got almost campus because I would not put it on my activities report you know, that I, I, I didn't want to be dishonest. And so I'd take the demerits, even though I was out four or five hours on, on bus routes and stuff or, or fisherman's club, I couldn't get them through the Romans road. Honestly, I wouldn't, I take the demerits. So. Well, I probably, I probably filled out some reports a little dishonestly. I got to mm. admit. And, and I got to tell you, one time I flat out lied to a, a, a staff member up there. And, and I'm a little bit ashamed of it because I try not, I try to be honest. Mm -hmm. But he asked me straight out one time and said, do you like it here? <laughs> and I knew and I knew kind of any answer short of, yeah, uh, would got me thrown out. And back in those days, I, I, I stayed there the Mostly the only reason I stayed there is because my parents were paying for it and they didn't want me to, I didn't want to disappoint them by being a failure and I didn't want to disappoint my pastor. So I would have said and did anything to stay there, but I, I didn't like the place. At one point I tried to transfer and wanted to go to Bruce Cummins school in Massillon, Ohio. And my pastor talked me out of that and I pretty much stayed there and survived and my wife and kids actually don't believe I kept my mouth shut enough to keep being tossed out of school. <laughs> that is that type of personality. That's quite an accomplishment. I've had yeah. some friends that didn't make it. I, it was tough. And I mean, uh, as I said, I was homesick. I, I, I still regret going there. I wish I'd went with my uh, best friend in high school and went to join the Marine Corps. I think <laughs> it would have got more out of four years. Of, yeah, I'd have been homesick there, but uh, at, at least at, at least it wouldn't been pretend, you know. Uh, yeah. I, uh, Do you remember I the Marine regret. Corps? Uh, you remember Dean Meister? Yes. Dean Meister and I his... Yeah, you bunch had of scumbags. A, <laughs> I had a friend. I had a couple of friends that were, like I said, out there that were kind of outlaws. And one of them was very good in music and he played piano and he was, he played guitar, he played piano and he was really great playing the piano. Well, he was, 
we were in one of those practice rooms downstairs somewhere, yeah. I think close to Gedler's Way there once. And he was in there and he was playing what he called honky tonk style gospel on his piano. And, and, and I, I, that's his description for it. And, and I kind of like it. I think it's a pretty good description of what he was doing. But he's playing it on that piano and the door opens and, and Dean Meister, <laughs> Mel Meister walks in there. <laughs> and he stands there and listens to us. Well, Billy, my buddy, uh, turned around and he just kept playing. He said, hey, we're caught. I figured it'd look suspicious if I stopped. So he just finished. Meister stood there and listened to him until he got done. He said, I could stand there and listen to that all day. Walked out the room, <laughs> shut the door, and went on his way. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, he's a scary guy to me. You know, yeah, he kind of he kind of spooked me, but I changed my opinion that, and then I had one other run in with him. Uh, I me, I've never been back to Hiles Anderson since I left, and I wanted to go back more to just see how the place changed or whatever. Mm -hmm. Not so much that I, I feel drawn to go back uh, that I might be welcome there. It was more out of curiosity, and. In that case, it would be sort of returning to the scene of the crime. Uh, I had a television in my room. So how'd you manage that? Well, uh, I I was in Baptist City, and I was in one, I was in one of the the dorm rooms. I had the lower bunk. Uh, we had a we I had a blanket up under the mattress of the guy on top of me. Of course, he knew it too, but. Uh. And they allowed what they called a TV radio. And, and so I would have an earphone listen at TV radio up at the head of the bed. Meanwhile, down at the foot of the bed, I'd have a TV on listening to what it was playing down there. And of course, nobody knew it. And I turned it facing me so it didn't, the light and the flash didn't show uh, through the window screen, you know, curtains. Mm -hmm. And I'd be sitting there watching TV, watching Westerns and, <laughs> and and so that that's a background for some else of what i did uh there we got called into dean meister's office that one year and he heard he asked about was there a hanky panky going on in the room there well i wasn't about to confess anything till i knew what hanky panky was referring to and it turned out that one of the guys that, that slept in the outside room, him and and the guy in the back room back there were uh, engaged in some prayer back here on their bed in their underwear. And, and and so anyway, I was glad I didn't confess to Hanky Panky that was going that I was actually doing because what he was talking about was a whole lot more serious than anything I'd done. Oh. Anyway, that that guy got tossed, uh, and well, we thought me and my roommate that was up in that front room that knew I had the TV actually thought that guy was a tad strange right off the bat, hmm. and uh, he, he just so happened he traveled Joe Boyd. That doesn't mean anything one way or hmm. the other, but uh, yeah, he got yeah he got tossed, and the other kid got tossed, and but. Uh, I did some other things. Me, me and a couple of my friends, every year during the Country Music Awards, we 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 had work passes and we'd go rent a hotel room and go watch the Country Music Awards in a hotel room every year. <laughs> oh, you can find all these things out later. Uh, oh, I, yeah, yeah, I wasn't one of the model students. Okay. Yeah, I, I was a, a model Hiles Anderson student. I was not a good student. Uh, I had not really learned the good study habits. And so I, I, it took me to 1987. I started in 79. Uh, I was Hiles until 84. My, my second daughter uh, had been born and we ran out of money. So we came back to Pennsylvania. And there's a school in my hometown, a theology school. And I went there, finished there. But it, I didn't really learn good study habits until I, I was into the ministry. You know, I, I was always at ping pong table playing activities, you know, and I just try to wing it with the study and I'd fail courses. I failed Greek. I failed. I mean, 
Now, when I, I took uh, I took Hebrew on a online course here about a, about four or five years ago, and I did a real I think I might have aced the course. I can't remember anything now. You know, you know yeah. but but the Greek when I was a student, I was too busy doing other stuff to study. You know, and and I learned the hard way because it took me eight years to go to the four year course. My older oh. brother, my older brother was a whiz student. Yeah, I mean, he never had to crack a book and it came easy for him. And I was a B and C guy in mm -hmm. high school. So I had learned to study. I struggled with algebra in particular, yeah. almost failed it. And I had to really buckle down and work hard to pass it. Uh, you know, I like things like English. I liked history. Mm -hmm. and, and it probably explains why I'm an author now. But uh, of course, I wouldn't have known that back then. If you told me even in college that I'd be trying to write books, I laughed at you. Hmm. But uh, I learned to study well, and I, I did. I had a, a cassette recorder, and I'd, I'd go and record questions I thought was going to be on the test and then leave a blank in, in space, uh, soundless, and then I'd give the answer to it. And I had an earpiece in my ear and I'd lay down every night listening to that. I actually had, hmm. uh, my brother had trouble in college too. And actually my son was a whiz student in, in high school, but he failed his first year of college as a pharmacy student. And uh, he actually learned to study after that. Actually, he was just elected to the uh, high board of pharmacy uh, hmm. just the last couple of weeks. But he was another one of the students like my older brother that the, the stuff came easy to him, but he didn't know how to study. Well, that was the difference to me. I knew when I got there, I I'd, I'd had to study in high school and learn how. And so college, I didn't like it there. I wanted to get home. I wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. And yeah. so there wasn't any way I wasn't, uh, wasn't going to get out of there in four years. No. When you left the college, did you ever have any ministerial opportunities? That uh, yes, I, did, did... I I actually believed at the time uh, that God had called me to preach, and I was an assistant pastor at a church for a while, and and this guy I think really wanted someone to do his work for him, and and he wanted to just uh, take his position, and I actually was. Uh, I actually spoke at some churches and I actually would have candidated for this one place had they called me. I spoke there in the interim between pastors and uh, the doors just didn't open up. And at some point I decided, well, evidently God didn't want this. And, mm. and I surrendered my life to him as a kid. And, and the, according to my pastor and the pe my parents and stuff, all of them thought that meant that I should go into ministry. And I don't regret, I don't regret preparing for it because I think it prepared me for some other things. But I, no, I don't, I don't believe God truly called me to preach. But mm -hmm. I can't say I never speak. Uh, I, I've spoken occasionally as a layman. I've been a uh, usher in my church. I try to, you know, be active in my church and and uh, I've driven church buses and things such as that. Mm -hmm. But I actually believe. Uh, that, that I found what I'm, I was supposed to do. And uh, I wrote one book for Oliver Reza asked me to write a book. Uh, and he wanted some, he was starting a radio station in uh, West Union, West Virginia. And he wanted something that was patriotic and uh, it was patriotic and also about history to read on the radio station every day. So he wanted like a two year daily reading for it well i i fortunately had brains enough to say no i can't give you two years i'll give you one and he'd asked several other people well, i was the only one fool enough to actually finish it <laughs> and 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 he reads that book uh, that book's out of print but it will be back in print very soon mm -hmm. but it, it's called america's history is his story and he reads that Every day, uh, the, the daily reading, it's kind of like a daily devotional of hit, uh, patriotism in history. Hmm. And he reads that, uh, somebody there reads that on the radio station every day. And it's the only program that's played every day, 365 days a year, is, is a book I actually wrote for, uh, at his request. Hmm. 
and so and maybe in that sense, I spoke to more people than I could ever spoke to as a pastor. Right. Yeah. When I was there, I know in our youth group, we were in a re- relatively small church uh, in Pennsylvania and every young man was called to preach. Now, I don't know why. I mean, we went to youth conferences. Uh, I actually went forward when Dave Hiles preached one time on, on giving your, yourself to the Lord. And I felt that I was called to preach. Uh, but my f- former brother-in-law, all my buddies, I mean, they were all at one point called to preach, but you know, they eventually went yeah. off to other things, you know, but I think there was that, that idea that uh, I don't know if it's because the pastors felt like they could get a notch in their belt, you know, with, with how many preacher boys they had or whatever. Uh, I, I actually wanted to leave there my, after my first or second year, because I wanted to stay with, near, near where, uh, to, to my girlfriend, who's going to be my wife. Yeah. And I was talked out of it. Like, like you said, the pastor said, you don't want to be a quitter. So, well, I want, I'm going to go to a different school. No, you, you're, you're at Hiles Anderson. You stay there. He talked me into staying, you know, until, until thank, I, thank I, you. I, you know, after yeah, I was I, Yeah. I experienced <laughs> the same thing. I was going to go somewhere else too. And, and it may have been, it may not been, I was led to go somewhere else as much as I was hoping to go somewhere closer. Uh, I yeah. do know one thing, the, the only thing that got me through those four years of not wanting to disappoint my pastor or my parents, but I never took all my clothes home when I made trips home. I made about 42 trips between the college and home in those four years. Hmm. And I always left something up there. And I can tell you, uh, brother, I, I, can I call you Jeff? Yes, yes. Jeff, I can tell you more than once, I was only going back to college to get my stuff. Huh. And and then when I got there, well, I'll give it two or three more days. That two or three more days is how I got through those four years. Hmm. And if I'd ever brought all my stuff home, I don't believe I'd ever gone back. Huh. I, wow. I just... And I'm sure if I'd gone to Marine Corps, I'd been homesick too, but they'd have kept me so busy. I wouldn't have that time to worry about it. Right. But that, that, that homesickness of being away four years and maybe being away four years at some place I didn't like very much is, is was good for me. I, I won't say it wasn't. There's and, a certain mature, I, maturing factor to that as well. Yes. You know. yeah, I, the, the small town kid that going to the big city, uh, isn't a bad thing. Uh, mm. and, and I, I learned, I, I'm sure I developed some character from the stories you may hear about my college experiences. You may question whether I had any then or not, but, <laughs> but, uh, mm. uh, it, I, I, I can tell you one thing I would have been tossed and they knew half the things that I mm. did or said. And, and really in, in light of today's, uh, circumstances and revelations about what happened in that school since then nobody would consider what we did even even right. bad now i mm. mean we didn't drink alcohol we didn't do anything like that we we went and watched the country music awards in a hotel room i mean that's that's, <laughs> that's pretty wild pretty wild <laughs> yeah you know i was in baptist city my first couple of years too and i was there one evening i was getting ready for bed and there's a pounding on the window, you know, and it just startled me. And I, I was almost asleep, yeah. I think. And I went up to the window, opened it up. It's one of the other students. He said, security's right around the corner. Open the window, let me in. So I opened the window. He comes diving in the window and he hides. <laughs> and then he just says, thank you. And he goes out the front door and takes off. I had no idea what was going on. But Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm sure there were good stories like that. Uh, yeah, oh, it's just... Well, I think a lot of it was you're you're attempting to force a certain mode of uh, behavior uh, without really focusing on the spiritual side in so much, you know. And I found when I went to another college, I found it to be the exact opposite. They didn't want didn't control anything about me, you know. As far as they didn't tell me that I had to cut my hair. One of the guys in school with me had hair down to his shoulders. You know, I'm, I'm looking at what's this guy doing. You know, this is a another another school, yeah. a fundamentalist Methodist school. They're all believers, different types of backgrounds, but 
the experience there made me realize these guys were treating me like a three-year-old, you know, yeah. controlling everything about me, my, even my thoughts. You know, I had to be careful what I was saying. Oh, I can't think of anything nasty about Brother Howells or question his character, you know, and all that. And uh, that did get me in trouble as a pastor when that article came out by Sumner. Uh, I, I had people in, in the church that I was in that were from Bob Jones and other places, and they were bringing me this stuff and asking me questions. What's going on at Howells Anderson? So I wrote a letter to uh, Bill McSpadden because I worked with him in the activities department. And I included a copy of the letter. And I got the most nasty, excoriating letter back uh, from Bill McSpadden because I dared question the character of Dr. Hiles. You know, and that, that started to open up my eyes a little bit then. Yeah. You, know, that, you can't think. I was uh, out. I was out of college uh, during the whole 100% Hiles yeah. back and forth stuff. And, and I mean, honestly, uh, our, the kids in our uh, church went to a, uh, another church's Christian school. And, and uh, they, when that, the, the other church, the Independent Baptist Church, uh, kind of, went with the biblical evangelist side mm, and yeah and then our pastor they kind of went with uh they were the 100 percent Hiles crowd mm. and and so we pulled our kids out of there and started a christian school at that time and and i said clear back then i said uh this school will not succeed because you built the school on the wrong foundation mm. you didn't you, you didn't build it on a, a biblical needs foundation you built it because two preachers couldn't get along with each other mm. and 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 i'll just be i'll be quite honest with you our christian school it should be disbanded and uh we only have two students here most of the students in our school right now are coming from another church and and so we bear all the expense all the problems of a Christian school. And, and we have about two students there. Honestly, mm. we should not even have a Christian school. And it's, it's a rough thing to say. And, and I'm sure I wouldn't be very popular with probably my pastor for saying it, but I've said several things over the years. He's not real pop. Uh, no. that he's not real happy with anyway. Uh. And, and every school, every church in our area has been touched by the Hiles crowd. And, and I think that's good and bad. Uh, mm. So many of the things, even my own, and I hate to say this, but so many of the things my own pastor does are so, so similar to what Hiles and Scott did in far as their authoritarianism and, mm -hmm. and, and failing to surround themselves with people that, that will tell them anything other than yes. And, mm. And it's it, it it permeates the valley I live in, and so I could possibly look for another church, but I probably the church I would go to is is run by another Hiles graduate oh. who I've known since a, a teenager as well, and I get along with him well, but I'm not sure that would continue if I went there, and so yeah, I just I, I'm at the point right now where uh, it's a it's a pastor's responsibility to, to fulfill his roles. I support him when I can. I don't when I don't. And, and, I, and I, but I believe in the Baptist independent fundamental Baptist mm -hmm. tenants. Uh, but I don't support the Hiles and Scott methods. Mm. And yeah, I, it's a fine line. When, when I left, I, I was 100% Hiles, but in the course of the past 40 years, I'm about as opposite now as what you could possibly be uh, from what they wanted as a pastor. You know, that I remember Dr. Hiles saying, that you, in, what do you want, a preacher or a teacher? You know, what, what kind of, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not the screaming pastor. I, I am a teaching pastor. Now, I may raise my voice occasionally, but... My main yeah. goal is to get what's in the book 
into their their minds and without the theatrics you know so i'm and doctrinally uh in practice uh i think i've turned out to be almost the exact opposite i dr house would be very disappointed with me <laughs> i think uh yeah i i think i had to when i was talking about going up there i really had to I really had to kind of come to terms with how I felt about Jack Hiles. I pretty well, uh, there wasn't any doubt where I stood as far as Dave Hiles and, and Jack Scoff. But, but Jack Hiles was actually another uh, thing altogether. And I kind of went down that rabbit hole, the internet, where I, I kind of had to figure out where I stood on all this, mm -hmm. you know, what I stood on, where I stood on him. Because there's a large part of me that still greatly admires him somewhat, but I know he was bad there at the end. And I know he lied to people. I know he, mm. he, uh, he did things that, that weren't right. And I, but I, I've even heard there's, there's podcasts out there that go out of their way to indict everybody. And they call it IFB, you know, and like it's the cult. And now, were there cult like were the cult like members there? Sure, there were. Were there cult like pastors there? Sure, they were. But the problem I have is it. Uh, so you're going to indict a whole ministry because you had some a lot of bad messengers. Well, you're going to indict all Christ's teachings because one of his disciples was a devil. Hmm. I mean, I it just. Uh, to me, the truth is truth. Even though the messengers can be bad, it it, it doesn't mean uh, God doesn't God doesn't use anybody except flawed mm -hmm. people. There's nobody else to use. And and let me ask you a question: Were you there when Were you there at Hiles when Dave Hiles preached a sermon called "Deceived in Chapel"? I I remember him preaching, but I can't remember the titles and. And what he said. Well, this one there. you would this one you would have remembered, and I'll tell you why. Because he preached a sermon called Deceived about people that thought they were saved and really weren't. And and the altar was filled with uh Hiles Anderson men uh getting saved. Huh. Okay, now now this is gonna bring you back to uh where my problems with school and clear what I talked about back then. After these men went forward in a Dave Hiles message and, and said they weren't saved, me and my friends were sitting around that evening and in the next few days talking about, okay, who called these men to preach? If, if you went there saying you were called to preach and Dave Hiles or anybody preached a message that, and, and you went forward to get saved, how can you still be a preacher afterwards? And if you are, who called you? It couldn't have been God if you weren't saved. And and th these were the questions that would have gotten me tossed out of school quicker than yeah. the uh, country music award television programs. Yeah. Uh, things such as this it, is that I asked herself and nobody, nobody in the whole time I was there except us outlaws ever asked those questions. Because if you were unsaved, God did not call you to preach. And if you said you were called to preach, which you had to attest to in your testimony that you filled out to get in, in uh, accepted in the Hiles Anderson, you had to say that if you were going there a pastoral theology student. Mm -hmm. then, then who let who called you to preach? And nobody can ever answer that. Huh. If you weren't saved, God didn't call you. Yeah, that's it. I'm, I, I can't, I'm just trying to think maybe I was out that day or something. Cause I, I think I would have remembered that. That uh, I, I think that may have been my freshman year. So you may yeah, have, I wouldn't have been there yet, but, but uh, I've never heard anybody. The only people I ever heard ever discussed that in 40 years has, were me and my friends right at that time. And since then, hmm. and, and, uh, I've never had anybody ever give an explanation to that. And, and, and no, it's like nobody would talked about it. Hmm. And, and I saw things up there where I'd see, uh, 
Hiles up there telling us, they, they tell us in church education classes, they tell us, well, we do this here at First Baptist, but you shouldn't. And, and uh, we put women in leadership positions, but sometimes, but you probably shouldn't and, and things uh, like that. And even back then I'm thinking, okay, if, if we shouldn't, you probably shouldn't either. And that will lead to yeah. problems down the road. And sure enough, it did. Now, yeah. you know, we may have been more prophets than mm. we realized. Now, do, do you remember a uh, starting a New Testament church class with Les Smith? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was in that class, and I still have the notes. That's the only class I think I still have the notes because there's a lot of technical stuff in there, I guess, for, for you could use for church building and stuff. But yeah, um, I got to thinking years later. You know, he was at a, he was a Hiles Anderson student. He went back to his home area or someplace, started a, a church. And the way he did, he started the church, he ended up with like 50 people to start this church with. I mean, like the first day it officially opened. And I got to thinking, you know, that's not going to work in every every area because he's going to a Bible Belt area where you you already have probably a dozen or more Baptist churches. And you're going to have a lot of disgruntled people looking for churches. Uh, yeah. Plus family there and stuff, and even just 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 that idea to begin with, it just simply doesn't work everywhere, you know. That and I've tried stuff like that. I, I uh, I'm from the Pennsylvania, Central Pennsylvania area. I went over towards Pittsburgh and did did a little bit of surveying, tried to start a church in my hometown, and it, these just didn't pan out. Is you know, it's not Bible Belt, <laughs> you know, there has to be a certain type of atmosphere for that stuff to work. A lot of the stuff that they taught us there, you know, to actually. Yeah. Like... And, yeah, go ahead. And, well, just, I agree with it. There's a whole lot of things. And I mean, they gave us a whole lot of books to read that they didn't follow themselves. And, hmm. and, and I mean, well, obviously Hiles raising children books. I mean, it was obvious. Yeah. Were you were you there when when Jack Scott came down and told about how he got engaged to Cindy? I Chapel? remember the story, but I don't remember the details. Yeah, he's sitting there talking about him going out on a motorcycle, and and I'm sitting there thinking, okay, how'd she hold on riding on the motorcycle with him? <laughs> and how does this go along with I never let my kids uh, single date? And and I'm and era and. and and me and my friends are sitting there, and I'm sure everybody else is thinking, but they don't have the guts to say it amongst their friends. We're all sitting there thinking, everything you're describing here would get you tossed out of school. <laughs> if, if your name, if, if if one of the participants was named anything other than Hiles. And, and I'm sitting, and I never liked Jack Scott from that moment on, because mm -hmm. he's sitting there, in my opinion, rubbing our nose in it, being presented up there before us as, as a pattern to us about how we should be. And he's sitting there admitting he's breaking the rules, some that would got her and him tossed if if they were named Joho. And mm -hmm. and and I'm sitting there hearing this garbage and I'm getting disgusted listening to it because then they talked about all they got engaged and they talked about how wonderful it was and then they went out and threw pebbles in the water, and I'm I'm about to gag at that point, and and I got a real problem. I got a real problem with. Uh, look, I grew up on the farm, hmm. and and that kind of stuff to me is a little bit similar to what Dad loaded in the back of a nerve spreader and put on his fields. <laughs> uh, now, to be quite blunt, and and I I don't I don't. Uh, take well to people. I don't accept just because you tell me something from the pulpit, don't mean I'm going to accept it. And and uh, and I also don't like hokum masquerading as as scripture or, or, or Bible preaching. I just mm. don't buy it. Yeah. Huh. And 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 I'll tell you, Jack Scott too. This always did bother me. Uh, when when Hiles died and Jack Scott took over. It amazed me that we continued having pastor schools because I'm thinking, what can Jack Scott teach anybody about pastor school? Jack Hiles built a, a church. He built several, hmm. built them up big. 
he can talk to people about building a church. He, even with his flaws, he can talk mm-hmm. to it. Jack Scott, he didn't do anything other than marry well. And, <laughs> and I mean, he built nothing. Mm-hmm. You can't name one thing Jack Scott ever built that, that well, eventually he built an auditorium that they couldn't afford. But nothing, he never, he never successfully built anything. And it bugged me, him continuing pastor schools, having someone that never built anything, telling other people how to build stuff. Uh, hmm. Frankly, I would never want to hear that. I, I, I don't want to hear a guy that never built anything telling me how to build. Hmm. I just, I, I just, it's more of that, that stuff we put on the fields back home. Yeah, it's like, uh, did you ever see that Rodney Dangerfield clip uh, back to school with that yes. business teacher? Yes. You know, he's talking about building a business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I, he reminds me of. I actually saw more than the clip of that, just, just uh, I'll confess. Uh, uh, okay. And, and Rodney, Rodney Dangerfield was always a personal favorite of mine, I got to admit. I, yeah, he was funny. Cracked, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I just... I just never, Jack Scott was never somebody I liked. And, and then he spoke at some, uh, he spoke at some pastors uh, uh, or some youth things in some other states where my kids actually went when they were teenagers. Hmm. And some of the stuff they told me he was saying back then, I, I think we decided we would never send another kid to anything he was speaking at. Hmm. And then the year he got tossed up there, uh, one of the local churches that had a pastor that I said went there the same time I did, that I know since I was a teenager, Jack Scott was coming there to speak. And this would have been 2012. Uh, and I remember it because we had a weather event called a derecho that night. And it was almost like a, her, uh, a tornado. And I was dodging obstacles going to that church that night to hear Scott speak. Not so much because I was interested in hearing him speak. It was more out of curiosity. And I went to hear him speak that night. And, uh, and then they had a little event afterwards, a dinner for the, all the uh, pastors and also the people that went to Hiles Anderson. And I went to it. And, and Jack Scott said some things that night that were really odd and bizarre to me. And I thought, what's he talking about? Why is he saying this stuff? And it just seemed odd. And then about a month later, I'm mowing my yard out there, and I've got a set of uh, headset radio. And I was actually listening to uh, uh, Glenn Beck on the radio. And during one of the news announcements, this had been just about 30 days after he came there to Parkersburg, West Virginia. Mm-hmm. And I heard him. They mentioned about some big school in uh, – Chicago area, uh, the pastor in trouble for such and such. And I thought, that sounds like Hiles, that sounds like Hiles Church. And I, I shut my mower off, took my radio off, went running in the house and got on my computer and looked up uh, headlines about Hiles Church, First Baptist Church of Hammond. And there it was. Mm. Scott was, and because what I'm hearing, I thought, that sounds like Scott. And I never heard the name though. I was, about half paying attention and yeah. I went in there and sure enough it, it, it was and, and I mean uh, wasn't all that surprised about it and some of those odd bizarre things he said at that night started to make a little bit more sense some of them were creepy I mean about some of his counseling with young girls and stuff I thought good grief what this is creepy and I thought he was creepy for years and yeah. it was pretty well proven out hmm. Yeah, wow. Now, you you mentioned, um, let me see, I I have a couple of things. I wrote wrote down a couple of questions here, just in case I forgot them. Uh, What was, what do you think was your most positive experience when you were there? And and I think we may have already covered it, but I have your most positive experience and your most negative. Uh, Probably my, and this, this may surprise you. Probably my most positive experiences in Bible class was Joe Combs, mm. and and he, you you'll remember this when I talk about it. He you know he talked about what you do with the Word of God determines what God does with you, mm-hmm. and, and and little 
saying such as that, almost kind of in a, a form like Proverbs and great truths and, and short sentences. And, and honestly, I think learning that and hearing that helped me in my writing. And, and I kind of write that way. Even I will even work on Twitter a little bit in the political realm sometimes. And I, I write things that are kind of like that. And, and so honestly, the influence of Joe Combs on, on, on me as far as thought patterns and, and writing ideas, making uh, deep thoughts into, into brief sentences, uh, I think was huge. I, I, I think it was invaluable to me as a mm. writer and, and, and many other things. Uh, the worst experience, uh, about about the first day or two I was there after my mom and dad left, and I was feeling pretty bad, uh, I was listening to music by, uh, it was either Robbie Heiner or okay. Don Norman, who was with Jerry Falwell in the Old Time Gospel Hour, and I had a dorm monitor, uh, and I could give you his name even today, and I won't. Uh, come up to me and chew me out and basically threaten to throw me out of school because I was listening to this heathen syncopated music. And I th I just thought it was regular Christian music. And of course, by that time, Jerry Falwell had fallen out of uh, favor with the independent fundamental Baptist movement. Okay. But, but that was probably one of my worst experiences there. And I mean, I'm kind of homesick. And, and really the last thing I need at that point is, is, somebody i'm thinking i'm trying to be a good christian i'm trying to uh do the right thing and i'm listening to music and i don't know i don't see any reason to think anything was wrong with and i get jumped on and almost threatened to be thrown out of school and wasn't there a week that was probably my worst experience oh, there wow. probably probably poisoned the rest of my college years there hmm. okay and, yeah, I, and, and as years have shown uh at least Jerry Falwell didn't have any uh, sex scandals about him. I'll say that. It, right. Same cannot be said for his son, but but Jerry Falwell himself, uh, nobody accused ever accused him of what uh, Dave Hiles or Jack Hiles or Jack Scalp was accused of. Mm, so right. it, when we go rate him as far as morality, uh, Jerry Falwell might got tossed being a leader in the independent fundamental Baptist movement, but I'll take his christianity over that other <laughs> stuff anyhow. yeah that's one way to look at it you know i i don't think i really had experiences like that uh, mine was just bland except for the the drudgery i just remember the drudgery you know going to work <laughs> going to school the, the the activities reports and always always looking over your shoulder am i doing everything right you know i i was yeah. uh i had a uh they had a hair check. You know how they would shut the doors, all the way yeah. would leave, no escape. And I don't know. This may have been after I was married. I can't remember, but I came out the door. And remember Stubblefield, Mister Stubblefield? Yes. Okay. Well, he came up behind me and he went like this in my hair. He said, "You look like a hound dog." He wrote me up for demerit. So I'm thinking, I just got a haircut. You know, but <laughs> it did not do the. You know that, and I, I thought that that was one experience that I it really made me bitter because I thought I was doing everything I could do, and they're still getting me. You know, I, I couldn't I couldn't live up to the standards. Yeah, well, I like back then, and always, if you notice my sideburns, uh, they're they're pretty long. I've always liked them, and oh, okay, I always yeah. like speaking of hound dog. Uh, <laughs> I always like sideburns, and and uh, and. Yeah, they're pretty long. They're clear at the bottom of my ear, and uh, my my hair's a little long for even for me. But I've never really never really had long hair even in the seventies. Uh, but it's kind of around my ear. I'd get tossed for sure out of Hiles right mm -hmm. now. But uh, I'm pretty well. I never really had long hair even in the seventies. But I, I I did I I thought all that was kind of stupid. I I mean. Uh, that so much of that just it was what it was i could live mm. with it well i mentioned about going to the other college it's more out of desperation i was trying to get some credit hours so i could go back to hiles yeah and 
when I, when I was there, I'm learning all of these things about systematic theology, you know, that I had never heard before. And I was confronted with things that I had not been confronted before in this little theological school, you know, that, uh, and, but, but, but there was none of that other stuff. You know, I didn't have to cut my hair a certain way. Didn't my wife didn't have to wear dresses. We still did. Uh, yeah. But uh, I, I got to later looking back on that, you know, that had the substance, you know, that school was giving me the substance, the, the theology, although Dr. Howes would say that there was more, uh, what do you say, more theology or more scholarship in the toilets of Howes Anderson than, than some of these other schools. But uh, I, I found the, the, the opposite there. I mean, a small school, not a big, not a bunch of hubbub about it, but the substance was, was uh, to me, I couldn't even, I couldn't take it all in. I was, I was, it, it was just overwhelming to me that, you I mean, people actually study this stuff. You know, the closest that I came when I was there, I think was um, Ed Reese's class on yeah, yeah. Uh, historic, the, his, Christianity, Christian history. I think he had something like that where he would go into the details. You know, we would actually study Augustine and we would study uh, Whitfield or we, and I got, I remember sitting back and listening to his class and say, wait a minute, none of these guys are like us. <laughs> you know? yeah. There's always something different about them, but yet they're the ones that made the impact in history. All that later came back to me, you know, and, well, and uh, once I had been shaken Reese, out of it. Yeah, even Reese's talk about Billy Graham was interesting in light of, uh, mm. you know, Hiles. I mean, you know what he said about Billy Graham and, uh, and, and it was That's to refresh my memory. Well, he, he really praised Billy Graham. You know, he, he kind of confronted some of the issues Billy Graham had too, but uh, honestly, Reese was kind of a, uh, he, I mean, he didn't quite follow the Howells line completely. Yeah. I mean, and, and nobody seemed to have any real complaints about him actually delving into these individuals uh, that, that maybe would have been considered problematic to the fundamentalism of the seventies and eighties, you know, yeah. and, and, and I thought it was, uh, it, it was interesting. And I mean, it was just, it, some of that stuff kind of challenged my thoughts up there. And there wasn't a lot up there that challenged you, in mm -hmm. my opinion, it, 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 uh, and you weren't allowed to think the, the last thing they want right. you is to think for yourself. Mm -hmm. And, and that was where I had a real problem because I, just I, you know, I don't take I, I don't take your word just because you said it. I mean, you, mm -hmm. I, I'm loyal to a fault if you give me reason to, uh, mm -hmm. and and I cannot I can be loyal to you, and never never agree with you on everything. Uh, I don't, but uh, I don't. Well, I think maybe Hiles might even said it, and I kind of agree with it. Loyalty is not the absence of disloyalty. It's it's maybe disagreeing with a person, but still being able to follow them. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and I believe that, but mm. I, I, I think people that surround themselves, uh, leaders that surround themselves with people that just say yes to everything they're doing are not serving themselves well. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's probably what led to a lot of trouble up there. And, and honestly, I see I hate to say it, but I see that in my own church. Hmm. Yeah, I've, I've been reading a book. Or we have an intern pastor who was connected to uh, down in North Carolina. There was some Hiles connection there. And um, I can't think of the fellow's name. Bob Gray Sr. had preached okay. in his church. And he bought a book from him on uh, introducing Jack Hiles to the next generation. I've been reading the book. And there's a lot of these good sayings in there, like you had said. But then I got to thinking, but in practice, you know, we never really had the opportunity to, to think like that. You know, we were always being careful to toe the line because if you, like you said, if you deviated and you asked the wrong questions, you, you could be out on your ear. You know, yeah, I, got, I wound up with about 75 demerits one time, got real close to being tossed mm. uh, just mainly because of, uh, I disagreed with uh, a uh, dorm monitor uh, and 
water. That's about the biggest uh, trouble I got into there. And, and I kind of challenged the guy on something and, and that wasn't, that wasn't done there. Now, maybe you can go into detail. What was the, what was the, was it a theological issue or was it a, a personal issue or? It, it was probably personal. Hmm. And, and, and I just, I, I don't remember the specifics of it now, uh, but I kind of challenged his leadership on it. And uh, of course you didn't do that there. You know, yeah. all and I always did have a, I always did have a problem with this. You know, you know they talk. Hiles would con- constantly talk about touch not God's anointed. Right. And the problem I had with that is, how do I know God actually anointed that person? And and <laughs> right. And, and and another problem I had with it, I'd read the the epistles. And Paul would criticize Christians by name sometimes, such mm-hmm. as John Mark. And later he praised him, but but he named people by name that done him wrong. And that was back in the days we didn't dare mention anybody. And I'm sitting there thinking, if Paul thought it was okay, uh, maybe we shouldn't, maybe we ought to try to be a little bit more like the the Bible than than Hiles, you know, little thing, yeah. you know. And, yeah, I think. There was a lot, a lot of, uh, of 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 good sayings like that, but actually putting them into practice. And, and I have one of my videos I put out is on that sermon that Jack Howes preached whenever he was confronted with with that issue with uh, Jenny Nischik. And people uh, were, were he lists, he gives that list of several people: uh, Godfrey and Nischik and Glover, and there's some others I can't remember, but. But he's more or less saying, well, you turn me into the IRS, I turn you into the IRS, you know, yeah. uh, and I can see almost the exact opposite of what we have been taught as to how to deal with people. Like, like don't criticize people. Whenever you're attacked, don't, don't attack again. All of a sudden, that was all thrown out the window. Yeah. You know? And that just, that was the breaking point for me. You know, I had already questioned some of the doctrine because I had been in a Methodist church, a fundamentalist Methodist church, and I was already told, said, look, you got to make your up your own mind. I'd been to the school, and the school taught me, make up your own mind. And so some of the things that I was taught at Hiles, I questioned, because I was away from the system, I wasn't under them, and I was still loyal you know, to, to the whole thing, yeah. to kids to youth conference and stuff. But when that sermon hit, I thought, this is the exact opposite of everything I was taught. You know, the way the way that Dr. Hiles is treating these men that were praised by him over all those years I was there. All I heard was good things about these men. Now all of a sudden they're they're criminals that that really opened up my eyes that there's a great inconsistency. And I think it was just a matter of convenience. I yeah, and I I agree. And I, I saw that too. And I'm sitting there thinking, you didn't do this for years and you brag all to the point of bragging about you didn't do this mm-hmm. and then suddenly it was okay and i'm sitting there thinking okay that's you just violated principles that you said you've had for years and years mm-hmm. why and and so many of his responses to the biblical evangelist thing he didn't behave in my opinion like an innocent man would uh, mm-hmm. an innocent man would turn around and say i'm not guilty of this but but no, he'd say, well, this guy did such and such, or he was wrong about this. And honestly, I, to to put it in in well, I was going to say today's terms, but it's, we're talking nineties. Then it it looked a whole lot like a president saying, well, that depends on what the meaning of is is. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, a lot and of that, similarities. Yeah, that's what I took from it. There was a lot of word parsing there and, and things that that I I thought and and I thought. Y- y- and, and the problem I had with all of it, and it just hit me here recently, is that he meant he went and told about what uh, Vic Nischik was involved in all this, and he had an affair. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, but you knew all this, supposedly, and you still allowed him to be a deacon. Yeah, and teach so, Sunday school. So, so, so what kind of preacher are you? You know, <laughs> you know. You, yeah. you covered that up, and now you're going to tell us about it. Uh, 
that that doesn't tell me so much about him as it tells me a lot about you. Well, yeah, yeah, like like you said that if he did know all those things, I remember him being brought into chapel and teaching classes in church ed and being introduced as this this great man. Yeah, you know, and, and praising his family life or you know whatever else and but just on a dime everything changed like that. And I think it was just out of desperation. I don't know if he had any other options but to, but to go on attack mode. I, you know, I tell you, and I think now more and more that you've, you've heard the many times where Hiles bought this guy a car and Hiles right. paid for their houses and Hiles you know, employed this guy. I really think more and more that that had a lot to do with control. Mm, yeah. Look, uh, I, the guy's job, he's dependent on me for a job. I got his car. I bought his house. And and if you go against me, I can take all that away and you have nothing. And and that might be why you could turn around and ask a guy if he'll drink poison in his orange juice <laughs> and, you know, and the bonehead will say yes. Mm. Now, if my pastor asked me, I don't care who he is, Anybody ask me, well, you, you know, I'm going to put poison in this. Will you drink it? I don't care how loyal I am to him. No, you drink it first, and then we'll see how it goes from there. Uh, yeah. That's just where I am. Yeah, I, I've come to the conclusion that the uh, idea of the pastor being like a king, you know, that yeah. he has just about, he can say whatever he wants and demand whatever. I think. Uh, as far as church government goes, I think that is a flawed system. You know, and I, I think that also for a congregation to be able to just vote and do everything they want, it, it's like mob rule. I, I've, I've got to, I've kind of got to the, the point where I believe in an elder led system where uh, in, in our church, I'm one of the elders, I'm the teaching elder, but I have a group of men with me that are, are, uh, assisting me in in overseeing the church you know i'm not the one up there telling this you know you do this you do this let's set this up and everyone looks to me it's it's like we have this this whole group of men and and i am the teacher the primary teacher but these other men have just as much uh, biblical yeah. authority you know so i don't feel that i have any special position above anybody else in the church you know, I'm, I'm the teacher. I'm, I'm the one that's that's leading the church in that sense. But uh, if somebody if somebody started like they said, Pastor, let, let's let's do a special uh, uh, promotion. We're going to put your your face on a coffee cup, and we're going to give that out for everybody who comes on on this particular Sunday. I, I, I think I think it would. Uh, I think I just quit the church if they wanted to do that kind of stuff. I don't want want anything like that. Don't put my name on a you know, my picture on a calendar and put everybody's house, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's all, looking back on it, it's unfathomable to me in the position that I am now as a pastor of a church that people would do that, you know, that they would to, even to promote, you know, whatever, uh, to, to promote yourself as, as somebody so special, you know, and, and, uh, but, but I, I agree with that, but it, it seems odd hearing that in, in, and kind of agreeing with that. And then I'm in a, I'm in a business when I'm not working that, that really requires a lot of self-promotion oh. trying to be an author. And, and I mean, I'm uncomfortable. I grew up uncomfortable with that, but uh, if, if you don't do it, you are probably not going to be uh, as successful as you should be. And now you're talking of, about your work as an author. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I could definitely see that. Uh, by you know, the way, I uh, a... go uh, ahead. Uh, you're, you're, uh, I know that you write Westerns. Are these historic type Westerns or? Uh, basically, I, I put a lot of history into them. I, uh, I, they're, but they're strictly novels, but I also do some, uh, I just recently did a profile, a biography. Uh, of a guy that's mentioned in every book about the coal mine wars. Hmm. His name, his name is Charles E. Lively. And he was in uh, coal mine wars in the early uh, 20th century in West Virginia and Colorado. And the guy's mentioned in every book about the coal mine wars, but he'd never specifically been profiled. 
and I I wrote biography of this guy's life and uh, he he killed a man in April 1914 in Levada, Colorado, and which was essentially an assassination. He killed two people in the courthouse steps in Welch, West Virginia, on August 1st, 1921. And uh, this guy, I, I wrote his biography, and uh, but I don't do a lot of nonfiction work such as that. But mostly, I write novels, and I and I just learned here about a, a couple of weeks ago that I was named a Spur Award finalist in the Western Writers of America for an article I wrote about that book in a magazine. And it's probably a Spur Award or a Spur finalist is about the highest awards you can get in the Western Writers of America. It's actually hmm. fairly prestigious and I, I'm kind of hmm. uh, proud and honored to uh, win one i'll be uh, awarded it at the uh, western writers convention in montana in uh june oh congratulations thank you I'd, I'd be very interested in that book is it available on amazon yes that's available on amazon and okay uh, and i can pretty well prove everything i got in there it is deeply documented and uh it's it's quite a story and it really it kind of explains the whole coal mine moors uh makes them you understand them a little bit better and mm. but i i don't write a lot of books like that because it's a lot more work in novels to be yeah. honest with you uh and and my wife really doesn't like <laughs> my wife would prefer i never do any of those again because they do kind of tie up a lot of my life and yeah see i i, I work in the coal industry okay and yeah, we, we the uh, our business is located at a former coal mine here in pennsylvania well, this is a mining area you know, yeah. that, that's why I kind of. Well, yeah, it'd be interesting to you. It's, it's called The Nine Lives of Charles E. Lively, the deadliest okay. man in the West Virginia, Colorado coal mine wars. Uh, you know, you was talking earlier about the, the pastor of the church that I didn't want to disappoint uh, was a man named Walter A. Carney. Strangely enough, he was actually profiled on an unshackled uh, broadcast uh -huh. as well. Hmm. He was a turret gunner in World War II. Uh, honestly, Pastor Walter A. Carney, who's actually his granddaughter, is my daughter-in-law. Hmm. Uh, he was the finest pastor I ever seen. And when he left our church, I told him, I've never known a preacher that lives what he preaches more than you did. But he was an absolute, pretty much an authoritarian at the pulpit. But he ran the church like a business. And uh, if they wanted to do something with money, he, he'd ask the deacon who kept track of the was treasurer. He'd say, George, we got money for this. George say, no, we don't. He'd say, OK. And hmm. and that's how he ran things. And he never knew who gave what to the church. Now, he kept a close eye on the finances. And I mean, he it was actually somebody he did business with when he was building a new auditorium who actually John Rice came there and dedicated. Hmm. Uh Called, called him one time to his face, called him a redheaded Jew. And, <laughs> and but he was he was the finest man that that I honestly, as a pastor, I've ever known. Mm. Uh, he's he's almost ruined any other pastor for me. Uh, and the only guy that I know of that I a preacher that I would consider even anywhere close to that level would be Oliver Reza and hmm. and uh but Walter A. Carney in my opinion was an institution he was a man that had he had it right as far yeah. as is how a pastor should be he he was he was pretty authoritarian on the pulpit but he was never wrong up there either that I ever saw hmm. and and he ran the church the right way he wasn't a dictator out of the pulpit. It yeah. just a good man. And if you were going to have, if you were going to have surgery tomorrow at Cleveland Clinic at six a.m., he'd be there before you went into surgery and pray with you. Hmm. Yeah, he was that kind of man. Hmm. Yeah, I think that that's a good illustration there, as far as the authoritarian uh, when you're dealing with the Word of God. And you're pro you're proclaiming the word of God. There's that's where you have the authority. Exactly. You know? And and I've told I've told the men on my board, if I'm wrong, point that out. 
you know, don't be afraid to point it out. You know, if, I, if I'm teaching error, but at the same time, if I'm right, you're responsible for that. And I'm speaking as the voice of God, if I'm speaking from the word of God. But outside the pulpit, I'm in the board meeting. I'm, I'm just another board member. And I, can, yeah. I suggest things, you know, and is the, like you said, is the money there? Fine. If not, well, then, you know, we don't do it. But yeah. and some things I have are shut down. You know, it's just uh, because I don't run the church. It's it's uh, but but behind the pulpit, uh, if I'm faithful to the word of God, uh, I can be authoritarian because the word of exactly. God. Is, is, you should be. No, you should be. You know, the, the scriptures say there's safety in a multitude of counselors. What it don't say is a safety in multitude of counselors that agree with you all the time. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't say that the multitude of counselors isn't just to agree with you actually and in, in the fact that they can disagree with you not only you may think it keeps you from doing things you want to do it also protects you mm -hmm. as uh, your position and the church itself having men that that might sometimes uh maybe they consider a point you never thought of and right and, and personally i want to surround myself with uh open thinkers that that might bring up something to me i haven't thought of right yeah uh let me see if there's anything else uh bob that i okay. wanted to bring up i have a question here is your wife a hiles anderson student but you've already answered that i guess she was not yeah. no um and i think i wanted to come back to that because we were talking about that and i i, I mentioned that that they they were really really uh adamant that you dump the old girlfriend and, and pick up a house girl i married a girl from my church who was not no connection other than youth conferences with me and when we were there she would ask me all kinds of questions why are they doing this what's going on here she went to the foster club you know and all one lady would get up and say i had 33 people saved today she, she said jeff how did you have, how did a person have 33 people saved you know in one afternoon you know <laughs> But all these things, I mean, she's feeding me these things. I know why that they wanted you to marry a Hiles girls because they're oh, yeah. also indoctrinated with that. And that way you don't have that, that uh, outside influence. Yeah. You know? Oh, I think that was it. And, and I, and I'll, I'll mention, I actually, uh, I sort of stay, start with the word for it. We sat together at church, but and this will sound bad, but I was 20 and she was 15. Mm. And uh, we actually graduated the same year. We graduated from college and she graduated from high school. We got oh. married that year. And and her dad was a deacon in the church. And, and she, would, she would sit there and agree with this. Her and I hated each other's guts back then uh, or before that point. She thought I was arrogant and I thought she was... A, and she thought I was arrogant and stuck up, and I thought she was a brat. And <laughs> and we didn't like each other. She'd agree with this too. But uh, she, when she came up to graduation with my parents to see me uh, up at Hiles, she touched me on the arm, and and she will still tell you this today. Uh, I said, "Don't touch me! Don't touch me! Don't somebody will see, and I won't get to graduate." You know. And oh wow! I was scared to I was scared to death of it. Uh, now, uh, I probably once I got that paper in my hand, I probably kissed her or held her hand after that somewhere <laughs> and thought, hey, you can't stop me now. That, <laughs> uh, you know, we were clean when we got married and, and, mm. uh, I, I'm, I'm proud of that. And, mm. uh, I'm, and, but. Uh, they did. They did everything they could to get me to break up with her, and there was a lot of pressure exerted on me for that. Hmm. Now, the, do you remember chapel services, uh, sermons like that? You know, where they would they would tell you to do that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just in the back of my mind. I'm thinking that it came not only from just the atmosphere, but from chapel itself. Oh yeah, I heard hmm. that more than once, and I mean, uh, you know. It, it was hard not to influence you that way a little bit. I, mm -hmm. I, I got to say a couple of times, they almost turned my opinion on that a little bit, but I thought, ah, I like her better than anybody up here. And well, I and we've been married. Four, 
and we've been married 40 years this August. Yeah, it'll be 40 for us in June. But I work I work with some guys at the plant all the time uh, talk, that have been divorced, the guys I was working with, and they refer to their first wife. I said, you know, they'll say something. I say, well, yeah, my first wife's like that, too. Oh, shut up, yo ho, you know. <laughs> Yeah, Your first wife. I, I had, because uh, I capitulated to, to what they taught, I dated around my first two years, and I realized I don't want any of this. I know I know that my, my uh, um, lady's now my wife. I know her. I can trust her. She's not like these other girls. I, I, I think there's a lot of hypocrisy there and stuff, and I thought, I, I'm done with it. And I, I it took a while I to convince her, but, but – yeah. Yeah. I think I was in about, I might've been in my second or third year of Hiles before we started uh, sitting together at church and what you, you might call dating now. We were, yeah. uh, but I actually, I actually took a teacher up there to, to one of the Valentine banquets up there. Hmm. A woman named Judy Hobbs. that was one of the English teachers. I remember her. She wasn't my English teacher, but I actually took her to one of the banquets up there and stuff. Uh, but <laughs> uh, Joanne hates that name now. <laughs> well, who does that? Judy Hobbs. She don't want to hear about it. But yeah, I actually took her to a banquet up there. But, oh. but that was before I really started uh, seeing Joellen. But I, it was like something I was probably either my last two years in school. Uh, we were seeing each other or maybe in my last three, I can't remember which, but mm. I, I know we weren't uh, seeing each other my freshman and maybe my sophomore year. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so I want to try to bring everything to a close here because it's getting pretty late. Okay. Um, you already answered a lot of these questions. Uh, how, how long have you been writing the, the, your Westerns? I've been writing for over 30 years. I, I probably started, I graduated from college in about 82, and uh, I started work where I worked uh, a chemical plant in 84, and I probably started write, trying to write Westerns probably in about 87, somewhere right in there. Uh, okay. I, I, I read Louis L'Amour's books, and, and I thought, who's going to write books like this when he, he dies? And I thought, well, maybe I could. Uh -huh. and, and that's kind of how it started and then he died about two or three years after that and hmm. of course i haven't taken any of his sales that i can see yet but uh, yeah. i keep trying well uh do you remember didn't Voyle glover do some writing uh in that vein or was that somebody else in the church i'm trying I, I thought that somebody was was a writer of westerns you know now I that you met now that you mention that, I think there was somebody that did that, and maybe it was Voile. Uh, there was somebody that did that, and 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 it, you know, at first I thought, well, that don't really go with Hiles Anderson, but then I remembered Jack Hiles talking about John Rice was always reading westerns. Uh, yeah, when, when they'd be together in a hotel room sometimes. So hmm. I figured it's good enough for John Rice, good enough for me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, let's see. Do you, here's what, here's one. I think maybe we can close on. Uh, do you know, oh, no, no, that's, that wasn't it. Do you feel that the experience there at Head Hiles helped or hindered you in pursuing your career or your general life after you left? I don't, I don't believe it hindered me at all. Uh, it, well, slowed me down getting to where I was going maybe, uh, but, but I, I, I think even bad experiences are good for you. And, and I can't say that it was really a good experience for me, except in the fact I grew up and I was faced with a bunch of situations that I probably wouldn't experience to uh, stay in a uh, small town life. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it hurt me any, but I can't say it advanced me uh, as far as, I don't know I got anything out of school and I always kind of regret somewhat that I, that I can't say that I truly got an education. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I like to see what I'd have done in a state school, mm. uh, just how I would have measured up. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, sometimes I think that, but but because I am in the ministry still, I feel that it was even though I didn't get everything that I thought I re- re- need today, I did get some of the basics there. Uh, way waking up in the morning and doing the work and uh, doing the studies for the tests and. Uh, I really learned like hermeneutics and and theology at other places, but I, I think that the the idea of the character always being instilled, and like you said, the being the big city. You know, uh, did you work whenever uh, 1980? I think it was uh, when Ronald Reagan was running for president. They brought a bunch of us guys into the polls. Were you one of the poll workers? Did you do that? Man, man those two out, a couple of those outlaws I ran around with. We were precinct watchers in Gary, Indiana. Yeah, I was. At, I, I was by myself, but I was there in Gary, also that yeah. same same night. Each one. Well, uh, when I say we were, uh, one guy. I mean, we dropped all of us off at these different precincts yeah. and then picked us all up. So I was there by myself, and mm-hmm. and I got to tell you, I was the only white person I saw all day. And yeah, exact. That's exactly for same for me now. When I was done, the election was over. I, I told the guy, I called the guy that was picking me up. I, I said, I'll meet you on the corner. I went out to the corner to wait for him. A lady came out and grabbed me by the arm and said, you get back in here. I said, why? I said, you'll get killed out here. What? Because <laughs> I, I was the only white guy. Yeah. Well, I, the guy picked us up. And he told me that Reagan won. I said, you're a liar. Based on what the, the, the numbers we counted, exactly. he got beat three to one. And, and I mean, it wasn't even close. And, and I'm sitting there, oh, you're lying. No, Reagan's, Reagan's the president. Yeah. No, he isn't. And we went, we went down to the, the mall, down, I think down around Merrillville, and, and went out to eat down there. And sure enough, there it was. I, we might have been eating at a Shakey's or something down there. Yeah. And and we're watching the TV, and no, he wasn't lying. Reagan really won it. <laughs> I remember the exact same thing. I, I thought all those watching all these Democrats coming in right, uh, for Carter, and I see they they wouldn't let me put my posters up. I, I couldn't look at anything. They 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 uh, pushed me around. That I mean, I'm an 18 yeah. year old kid, pretty yeah. much, and 19 years old I think at the time. But. Yeah, that, that was that was probably the most interesting that I had. It was it was a real uh, baptism of fire in yeah. politics for me. I worked an all night service station in Dyer, Indiana, which was right on the uh, it was right on the Illinois Indiana line. Fact is, I mm-hmm. could throw a rock over in Illinois. That's how close we were. Yeah, uh, we had a uh, one night there. We had a guy come in there, two guys come in there drunk with a couple chicks in the car, and and one of them huge guy, I'm, I'm gassing up this black gentleman's car. And next thing I know, the guy's unzipping his pants, the, the drunk guy in, the, in his taking a leak on this black fellow's back window. Oh. And, and I hit the alarm, the silent alarm in my pocket, thinking we're going to have a rumble down there. And it just, I had actually hit it by mistake a few days earlier and had the cops all show up. And I figured they wasn't going to believe me at that point. And this then, the, fortunately, the black guy didn't say anything and got back in his car. And that, those two drunk guys were going to drive out. And just about then, three dire police cars pulled in and balked them from every way. The doors came open. The guns came over top of the windows. And uh, it was quite an experience. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> For Hick from West Virginia, it, it was, it was <laughs> yeah. We could go on and on some of these stories. Yeah, I was uh, coming, I was going on the, the uh, I think it was either Fisherman's Club or the bus route uh, down the Dan Ryan Expressway. They had us packed in the back of a van that had no seats, and we were all just sitting on the floor. And he's getting off the Dan Ryan, and I'm, I said, oh my legs! I started to stretch my legs. And lifted up my legs, and he and he hit the brakes, and I sailed up to the front, and I ended up with ten stitches in my head. I hit the bottom part of the seat, and uh, that yeah, that that, and I don't know if you I, you may have noticed the guy all wrapped up, and you yeah, know, yeah, but uh, yeah, that I may have seen you now. Now that you say that, I can't remember that. Maybe I might see yeah. you. Yeah, there there's like blood there and everything, you know, and I 
the thing that happened though, I, I, uh, I, I went like this when I, I was getting up and I looked at my hands and I said, I haven't been soul winning like I should. I have blood on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they dropped me off at a hospital. I, and then uh, that was the end of it for me. I was going to go street preaching with Arthur Harris that evening. Okay. And I, you know, and never did make it out there. I liked Arthur. He was a good yeah. guy. Yeah, you know, we did. I think I, I mentioned to you, we he was pastoring a church down the road yeah. from us. And uh, the pastor that married my wife and I, he pastored a church uh, and, and Arthur was coming to preach for him off and on. And Arthur's the one that when I was going to the Methodist church told me that uh, I told him I was worried that Dr. Hiles would like this. And he said, you do what God wants you to do, not what, what Dr. Hiles does. And I, I thought that was quite uh, good advice. Good advice. Uh, from, from Arthur. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't seen him since. I think, so. I think he, well, he's been to church since college and he, I think he's actually one of the missionaries we support. Now. Oh, good. Good. But, yeah, yeah, I, I, I didn't know what happened a, to him. Yeah. He's a missionary. I, in fact, is his wife passed away while he's on the mission field. Oh, wow. He's still there. Hmm. Okay. Uh, fine fellow though. Yeah. I always appreciated him. Yeah, well, Bob, I'm thinking it's getting pretty. We're almost we're almost two hours into it. I think that's pretty long. Yeah, sorry. No, it's, it's me too. But I don't meet very uh, many people that had the same experience that I that I had there. You know, we have to keep in touch. You know, it's uh, I'm good with that. Yeah, you know, you're in West Virginia, are you? I actually, I, I'm I'm in southeastern Ohio. I'm about thirty seconds down the road from the Ohio River. We where I can see the promised land across, but I, I never get to actually live there. I'm like Moses. Oh, you mean in West Virginia? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you're at, you're, at, you're people, not far from, you're not far from us then because we're not far from Pittsburgh. I'm two hours from Pittsburgh. So I'm three I have to hours go, from Pittsburgh. What's that? I'm three hours from Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah. we, we, um, uh, we probably passed by there. We, we went to the ark last year. We had to cut through Ohio uh, towards yeah. Cincinnati. And then we went down into Kentucky to go to the ark and the creation museum. So I think we passed by your area some, somewhere. I figure, yeah. You had to. Yeah. Yeah. I like to keep in touch. It's a interesting conversation and I'm sure we could go on and on and people that weren't there and, you know, people that maybe what went years later wouldn't understand a lot of this, but it leaves and, a mark you know, on you. Yeah, and and they didn't have the internet back then, so right. it changed. It's it's completely different now than it was before. And I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, people that doesn't go there, I don't get to talk to many people that went there that I could get along with. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people people that that are still loyal to the system, you know, to a T. We don't get along, you know, but no. people willing to look at it. You know, I, I had my fill of it. Yeah, I, you know. yeah, I, 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 well, I'll tell you sometime about why I didn't go back out there, but it had a lot to do with, I didn't want to be used by them uh, with the press being all out around them for this 50th anniversary thing. I didn't okay. really want to be used by them to, Hey, look at these people still loyal to the school. Well, I, I thought I, I'm not going to go be part of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I can and a guy in a cowboy that. hat might stand out among that crowd too. That's true. Yeah. And so I just thought, nah, I don't think so. Hmm. I backed out. I may go see it sometime, but it won't be when they're having a 50th anniversary. And and I don't know how they can have a 50th anniversary and not honor Hiles. And I'm not sure Hiles deserves to be honored. Right. I've often said that for them to be really get right with God, they, they need to disavow a lot of that association with, with Dr. Yeah. Hiles. You know, that the, the, the blind loyalty, a lot of the doctrines that he, he allowed to get into the church, the destruction, some of the, the destruction of the lives. You know, a lot of people, I, I have friends that their lives were destroyed. They're trying to yeah. stay loyal to the system and, you know, they, they couldn't do it. Mentally. And, and, the whole, and, and I'm sure you're going to remember this. He went years and years. Hiles never even mentioned his wife. Never right. talked about it. Never said anything about her. 
And then after all these scandals started, then you start seeing them pictures together. And they even got a statue outside of there, him and mm-hmm. Beverly. And and they didn't have anything to do with each other the whole time I was there, hardly. I mean, yeah, he, he didn't. Talk, I, I've got a problem with a guy that never talks about his wife. Uh, you know, how devoted are you really to her if you never say anything about her? Uh, yeah, until all that came out. That- yeah, and then suddenly you see them together everywhere. And I thought, something about this smells, you know. Yeah. And yeah, I don't buy. I think you know we're accused of uh, being overcritical, but you know being there and seeing that, and then seeing the change, you know something had to be going on. There had to be something being covered up. Exactly. You know? Yeah. You don't. People don't change like that. I mean, right. It, it, there's hardly no mention of your wife at all. You never see pictures of you together, and then all of a sudden you're everywhere together. Uh, no, nah, that that don't look right and mm. some not it don't smell right right yeah well i guess on that uh, that happy note maybe we, <laughs> we should <laughs> but uh well bob it's been nice meeting you nice talking to you and I, I wish you the best success in your endeavors with your writing Thank and i do you. hope to get that book on the coal mining that uh i don't have a lot of time to read outside of stuff for the I do for the church and study. So I, I work a full-time job as well yeah. as pastoring the church. And I do this on occasion when I can. I still have my taxes to do. My wife reminds me, you should really be working on your taxes. You know, but <laughs> but uh, that'll be coming next. But so I don't really get the opportunity to read outside of my studies, but I do want to get a I think I'll I'll be uh, ordering that book on the the coal mine. Yeah. yeah, I I've enjoyed getting to talk to you. It's it's been fun. I've I've had a good time. Yeah, same here. Yeah, uh, and uh, well, I guess take care, and uh, I I hope that the Lord blesses you. Same too. Just endeavors. stay in touch, man. Yeah, take care. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.